The truth about stories is that that's all we are. The stories we tell ourselves and each other about our lives, our experiences, our encounters, and ourselves <coughs> shape our world, how we see the world, ourselves in the world, our purpose and our connection to each other, and something bigger. And the stories we tell about our religion shape who we are and how we are as a spiritual community. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a shared set of stories about ourselves and about our origins. <coughs> Not every single one of us knows every single one of these stories, but the interaction between this set of stories as a collective and us Unitarian Universalists as a collective, this interplace creates a shared sense of identity for us. An identity that when we go to GA, or we visit a UU church in another part of the country, or we randomly meet a UU on the plane. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> it gives us a glimpse of recognition, a sense of belonging. <clears throat> of course, it's not just our stories. It's the songs we sing. Come, come, whoever you are. It's the rituals we share, like the flower, flower communion. It's our principles, of course and the values we stand for. And it is shared educational materials. Owl, coming of age, rebuild your own theology. But it is also stories. Stories about our history that make us feel like we're on a path. A path that our spiritual ancestors walked before us and on which future generations will continue on after us. A clear, smooth path that brought us from a moment of foundation to where we find ourselves in the present moment and also provides a sense of the future. Out of the ruptures and multiple strands and layers of history, we pick some stories and we weave them together like a robe to guide us through the tides of time so that we may remember our identity who we are, a rope of stories to guide us through the mystery of where we come from and where we are going. So who are we? What makes us us? Or to put it punny, what makes you, you, you? <laughs> <laughs> like any self-respecting millennial, I checked the internet. And this is what the UUA website told me on a page entitled, who we are. It said, and I quote, we are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. We are diverse in faith, ethnicity, history, and spirituality, but aligned in our desire to make a difference for the good. We have a track record of standing on the side of love, justice, and peace. Even in this, those three sentences, there's already a nod to a share his shared history, the professed track record to social justice work. Moreover, that site then sent me to links like Unitarian Universalist Origins, our or origins, <laughs> origins, I can do it, our historical faith. That qualifies me to run for president. <laughs> Which told me that Unitarian, and I quote again, Unitarians and Universalists have always been heretics. We are heretics because we want to choose our faith, not because we desire to be rebellious. And also, for centuries, people who profess Unitarian or Universalist belief were prosecuted. So these are the historical tenets of our faith in a nutshell. We are free thinkers. We are anti-oppression. And some of us once were oppressed for that. This is our story, condensed to three sentences. So as a good millennial, my next step was to go on Facebook, where I put this hypothesis to a test, a really informal one when I posted in several UU clergy Facebook groups asking fellow UU clergy, in your opinion, 
What are the foundational stories of Unitarian Universalism? The ones that we tell in the service. I got so many answers. Amongst them, John Murray and Thomas Potter's Chapel, a story we just told here in this church not too long ago. There's a story of Norbert Schaffeck, who founded the modern Unitarian Church in the Czech Republic, who was later tortured and killed in a Nazi concentration camp, and whom we remember whenever we celebrate the flower communion. <clears throat> there is King John Sigismund, who signed the Edict of Torder how many years ago? 51, right? Last year was the big anniversary. You listen. 451 years ago. There's the history of our symbol of the flaming chalice. And there was the story of James Reeb and the UU role in the civil rights movement, and also stories about gay weddings in the 1970s and the UU role in LGBTQ rights and marriage equality. And there were so many other stories mentioned. Maybe you wouldn't recognize all of them, but you would probably recognize some of them. And all these stories have in common that in some way they affirm that we are free thinkers and that we are anti-oppression, and in some cases these stories also tell of experienced oppression. And if nothing else, at least they do not challenge either of those statements. In a way, these are the stories that we want to be, what we want to stand for. Are they also, as Thomas King claims, all we are? The truth about stories is that no story only tells one story. Stories like history are multi-layered. They tell us what we want to hear, and they also tell us what we don't want to hear. One of the things these stories tell us that is hard for us to hear is about a lack of diversity. All of these stories I mentioned to you, and almost all of the many other stories that were shared with me, are a story about white Europeans or European Americans. The truth about these stories, too, is that we sometimes struggle with inclusivity and diversity. Now, let me be clear. There are many stories, many, 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 many stories of Unitarian Universalists of color, both in the US and in other parts of the world. Mark, Reverend Mark Morrison's Reed book, Reed's book, Darkening the Doorways, is full of them. But these are not stories we tell very often, because these stories tell a more complex story of free thinkers of color, of people of color being oppressed, and of Unitarians and Universalists at large not always being completely anti-oppression. Sometimes, in fact, we, or at least the white spiritual ancestors of ours, were the ones who kind of sort of oppressed our spiritual ancestors of color. These are not stories we tell very often because they do not align with what we want to be. And by not telling them, by only telling the white stories, we perpetuate a story of ourselves that centers whiteness, that is not one of inclusivity and that yet again silences voices of color. The truth about stories is that's all we are. If our stories cannot be inclusive, how can we be? If we cannot tell the whole stories, how can we be whole ourselves? So today, I want to tell you a different story. It's not one of the stories of the black pioneers in Mark Morrison's Reed's books, although these are worth telling too, and I really hope I get to them in a future sermon. I have a whole year left. <clears throat> Today, I want to tell you the story that comes from one of our biggest UUA members, the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines. It is actually a conglomeration of 29 churches, and the story of Unitarian Universalism in the Philippines is one that is so worth telling. It's about free thinkers and anti-oppression work, and it is at times even a little bit miraculous, like any good story is. And it is also about oppression. And it is about telling different stories than what we are used to. Since I do assume that at some point you want to leave today, I cannot tell you the whole story. I have to be somewhat selective. So here's at least part of the story of universalism in the Philippines. 
and how it evolved into the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines. If you want to know more, Reverend John Moore wrote a great book about the topic. It's called Monty Pie Universalist. I have it, I brought it, I'm happy to lend it to you. Okay, so let me start with the Philippines. The Philippines consist of 7,641 islands. 7,641 islands in the Pacific Ocean. They were under Spanish colonial rule from the 16th century until 1899. And after Spain ceded the Philippines upon their defeat in the Spanish-American rule, the Philippines stayed under American rule. That was the only time that American, that America was like in a, not just more, more new imperialist colonial rule, but like in an actual presence on the ground, we control this place rule, which is maybe also why we don't want to talk about <laughs> um, and they stayed until American rule until the occupation of the Philippines by the Japanese in World War II. And after the Japanese were defeated, the U.S. granted the Philippines independence in 1946. So the people in the Philippines spent centuries under foreign rule trying to hold on to their cultural identity while also being forced to interact with so many other cultural influences. One of them, Catholicism, which, introduced by the Spanish, remains the major religion in the Philippines. Enter Toribio Quimada. Oh, there we go. A free thinker, if ever there was one. Toribio Quimada was born in 1917 as the second of 13 children in a Roman Catholic farming family on the island of Cebu. As a young adult, Kimada was introduced to the Presbyterian Church by his cousin, which prompted him to read the Bible in a language he could understand for the first time. And this was a turning point in his life. Being able to actually read that text changed how he saw himself, how he saw the world, and he left the Catholic Church, his family eventually did too, and he started worshiping at a nearby congregation of Iglesia Universal de Cristo the Pentecostal Church of the Philippines. And after years of increasing involvement, he was what they call a super volunteer. <laughs> Kimada was called to ministry and ordained as a minister himself. So how did this Pentecostal minister find his way to universalism? In part, it was always in him. Even as a young man, he always questioned how a loving God could condemn people to eternal hellfire. And since Kimara never doubted the existence of a loving God, he did come to doubt eternal hellfire. <laughs> but that was not all. And this is where the either divine intervention or whimsy coincidence, you pick, <laughs> enters the story and renders it a little bit wondrous, a little bit miraculous. As a traveling lay minister of several small rural congregations, Kimara was always looking for new resources. In 1951, a new resource ar arrived in, by mail in the most wondrous way. Of, way. <clears throat> a member of a congregation wrote to him requesting a baptism for a new family member. And the letter they sent was wrapped in an old newspaper. As he looked more closely, he saw that the newspaper wrapping included listings of Protestant churches in the United States. So he first started looking for the letter, letter I, and then for the letter U, hoping to find Iglesia Universal de Cristo. Instead, he found the Universalist Church of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote to them, and he never heard back from them. <laughs> but a seed was planted, and after finding the address of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Gloucester, Massachusetts, Kimara sent a second letter which was answered and established a first point of contact between Reverend Kimada and universalism in the US. So in the way universalism wasn't exactly what he was looking for, and in the same, at the same time on a much deeper level, level, it was exactly what he was looking for. And I wanna bet that a few of us in this room are like, yeah, that's really familiar. <laughs> 
Though Reverend Kimada initially planned on staying with the Iglesia Universal de Cristo, his studies of the liberal universalist material sent to him influenced the theology he preached, which led to his being barred from ministry and excommunicated in 1954. A heretic, not because he tried to be rebellious, but he chose his own belief. He was so disappointed, yet despite that disappointment, Reverend Kimada did not falter in his ministry and instead, and with the assistance of the Universalist Church of America, started the Universalist Church of the Philippines in 1955. But the transnational partnership between the Universalist Church of the Philippines and that of the US stopped in 1961 because what happened in 1961? The merger. So when the Unitarians and the Universalists merged in the US, the Universalist Church of the Philippines was no longer recognized. <clears throat> and despite Reverend Kimada renaming the church to Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines, or UUCP for short, and his ongoing struggle for recognition, the UUCP would not actually be recognized as a member by the UUA until the General Assembly in 1988. During those roughly 30 years when he was struggling to be recognized by the UUA, Kimada also kept deepening his ongoing ministry in the Philippines. And a big part of that was his social justice activism. Reverend Kimada was a free thinker and he was anti-oppression. Specifically, Reverend Kimada fought for the rights of poor farmers to keep or regain ownership of their land after being threatened by the military, local officials, or big corporations. Reverend Kimada's efforts to grow the UCP in the Philippines went hand in hand with his social justice ministry and positioned him firmly on the side of underserved peasants and farmers. It was his social justice ministry too that led government troops to suspect him of being a political radical to Kimada's own oppression and eventually to his assassination in 1988. In the early hours of May 23rd, the Kimada home was set on fire. <coughs> his family fled the home, but Reverend Kimada stayed behind, and shortly after that, gunfire was heard from the blazing house. And after the fire was extinguished by rain, Kimada's body was found. Reverend Kimada had been murdered for his justice-making ministry. I do not think that the story of Kimada's life and ministry, the almost whimsical way that brought him to universalism and an American affiliation, his energetic church building, his deep-seated commitment to justice and his assassination, I do believe this story should be part of our canon of foundational stories. Reverend Kimada, was unquestionably a free thinker. He was anti-oppression, and for that he was persecuted, oppressed, and killed. And just a few months after his death, the UUCP officially became part of the UA. This is one of our stories, and one we need to tell. And this is also not where the story ends because the UUCP is still going strong and I think we need more to hear more stories about them and different stories about them. So often what we hear when we talk about the Unitarian Church of the Philippines, Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines, is stories about poverty and stories about economic dependence. These are our brethren and their poor give them money. They were hit by a typhoon, give them money, and by all means, yes, yes, the Philippines are a poor country, and in the Philippines, Unitarian Universalism is the religion of the underserved. By all means, do give money. But please, please, please don't believe that that is the only story about that exists or that is worth telling, because right now there are some amazing things in the Philippines doing amazing things. Reverend Rebecca Stiernes, who often travels to the US, she's Kim, Reverend Kimada's daughter, and she's currently still the leader of the UUCP. 
but there's also a new generation of Filipino Yuyu stepping up and shaping the church, and they are wonderful. I was lucky enough to meet two of them and meet the Lombard, and oh, if I have like this much of their ministry in me, then I'm set for life. <laughs> the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines just finished building two new, a new learning center, the one on the right, in 2013, or you left, the, the one with the roof. Um, and a dormitory for female students in UU Seminary against in Lumayente City, the Kimada Dormitory, in 2015. They are still engaged in social justice work and in strong partnership with the International Convocation of UU Women, they are currently focusing on empowering women by helping them build and maintain their own businesses. They are doing amazing work, work that is inspirational and work that is worth talking about. Theologically, they're similar in many ways and different in others. So for example, they have eight principles. It's pretty much our seven principles, word by word, but with an extra principle preceding all others. And that states that God exists. Very simply, that's all. God exists. And yes, I know that that may make some of us in the room squirm a little. And that's okay. You can squirm. <laughs> but, but. The theology that is put forth by several ministers in the Philippines, a theology that is unapologetically theist, but it's also unapologetically liberal in a deeply Catholic country, and it is unapologetically new you, is worth exploring and engaging with, even if we don't agree with all of it. And with this theology, the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines is much more comfortable spreading the news evangelizing even, than we often are. Strongly believing that we have good news and that our good news, our stories, are worth sharing with the world. So let's keep on learning our stories, all of our stories. The ones that make us feel happy and blooming and the ones that make us squirm a little for whatever reason. Because the truth about stories, the real deep truth about stories is they are not just all we are, but they are also all that we can be. Stories are dangerous, but there's also so, so much potential in stories. And as Rebe Reverend Rebecca Siernes, daughter of Reverend Toribio Kimara, said in a homily she gave in 2009, we must strongly build up our partnership relationship, church partnership relationship, because we are the torchbearers of religious freedom. Let us wake up to the realization for a need to share the meaning of our faith. If we do not, who will? If not now, when? May it be so, and blessed be.